but thank you everyone for joining us uh, for the Sustainable Phosphorus webinar series. I'm Matt Schultz with the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance, and uh, we're doing something a little different today. We're, we're going to do a bit of a virtual book launch for a new book called Phosphorus Past and Future. Uh, my colleague here, Dr. Ali Burkett of the Lancaster Environment Center will shortly introduce um, our speakers, Dr. Jim Elser, who's the director of the Phosphorus Alliance and Phil Haygarth. They're the authors of a new book on phosphorus as you see the title here. And they have, I think, successfully written uh, a book that's accessible to lay audiences that examines the history of the element phosphorus, its uses and some of the sustainability challenges associated with its use. Um, we'll hear, hear the story of how the book came to be and uh, what's in it. And uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. Before we get started, though, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items, and then I can turn things over to Allie for introductions. I want to tell you a little bit about the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance. So we're a members uh, organization. We're funded by our members. And we are North America's central platform to promote the sustainable use, uh, recovery, and recycling of phosphorus in the food system. We're supported by a great group of members, uh, and um, they make these webinars possible. If you find the webinars of value and the other work uh, that we do of value, please consider becoming a member as an organization. Uh, we get the question a lot, do, can individuals be members and know that we, our memberships are only for, uh, for organizations. But if you have an organization that would like to become part of our membership, we'd be happy to have that discussion with you. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Ali Burkett. Uh, Dr. Ali Burkett is the Research Promotion Coordinator at Lancaster Environment Center, uh, Lancaster University, UK. So we're getting someone from the East Coast of the Atlantic right now. Um, she's a field research ecologist by background and uh, she found it impossible to confine her curiosity for science to one subject and instead now puts it to good use providing communication support to researchers of her large interdisciplinary department. And welcome, Ali. And I remember to unmute, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> well done, a good start. <laughs> always, always the first challenge. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the introduction, Matt. Um, so I've got the pleasure today of introducing the authors of this brilliant book and our speakers, Jim Elsa and my colleague at Lancaster Environment Centre, Phil Haygarth. Phil is a professor of soil and water science here at Lancaster University. Um, he trained in geography and soil chemistry and spent 16 years as a soil scientist in the Agricultural Research Institute that's now known as Rothamsted Research. So he came from there to Lancaster for his professorship. He's known for his studies on phosphorus at the interface of soil water and how this might be impacted by climate change, as well as his passion for science communications, which is partly what brings us here today. Um, it was through Phil that I was first introduced to Jim in 2019 as part of the Phosphorus 350 series of events that Phil and Jim and colleagues organised here at Lancaster. Um, these events celebrated the 350th birthday of the discovery of phosphorus and a spoiler warning, I think you'll see the birthday cake from those events later in today's session. Um, Jim Elsa is a professor of ecology at the University of um, Montana in the, Uni the United States and the director of the Flathead Lake Biological Station. He also holds a part-time research faculty position in the School of Sustainability at Arizona State University um, and trained as a limnologist. He's best known for his role in the studying of coupling of chemical elements such as carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus in living systems and I suspect coming from Arizona has slightly better weather conditions than I'm looking at outside here in Lancaster. So Jim, if you'd like to take over today's session from here, that'd be great. Well, great, thanks for that introduction and uh, thanks, whoa, that's the wrong way, present, not, not share, okay. okay. Um, so thanks for those intro introduction, Ali. Thanks uh, Matt for um, uh, setting this up and, and uh, allow us to tell us how this this book came to go, came to be. Here's the cover of it. The top picture was taken of a wheat field, I think, in England somewhere. By it's taken by Phil, and the bottom one was taken by me in, in Flathead Lake, just sort of trying to bring the connections between water and food and the food system together. And they're really strongly connected by phosphorus. So how did I get into this uh, game of this big question of phosphorus sustainability? 
to, uh, to try to write a book about it. It really started for me, well, I studied phosphorus for a long time in lakes, but didn't think much more about it outside of lakes until 2007, 2008, when there was this massive uh, increase, 700% increase in the price of phosphate rock. And when I caught wind of that, it just sort of alarmed me and made me start to think about how uh, the amount of phosphorus in the world, the availability of it uh, uh, for supporting agriculture might somehow be limiting um, uh, in, in the long term, at least. And so it made me start to think about different ways about phosphorus in its broader context in society. So uh, following that, a group of us at Arizona State University, including a group of really talented graduate students, got together to form an initiative on campus called the Sustainable Phosphorus Initiative. Part of that, of, of that effort was to organize the second International Sustainable Phosphorus Summit on the campus of Arizona State University. We brought together a great group of uh, phosphorus scientists and specialists and practitioners who can form the letter P when given instructions, as seen here. And uh, this is the first time actually I met Phil Hager, and here we are actually up here standing next to each other in, in the letter P, but we really didn't know each other real well at this point. But this was a really tremendous event, and it started uh, for the first time to bring me uh, into a broader awareness of phosphorus and how it works in producing food and um, uh, in the food system. Soon after that, I just decided that I would need to write a book to make the story of phosphorus more widely known. Around that time, my, my sabbatical was being uh, planned and taking place. And so I started to outline some chapters of the book, rough out the contents of the book, sent out book proposals to various publishers, started my sabbatical, began to write. This is now the fall of 2011. The reviews of the book proposal came back, and at that time I decided to go with Oxford University Press to publish the book. And during my sabbatical leave, which was in Bariloche in Patagonia, uh, Patagonia in Argentina, um, I wrote the first three chapters of the book, and I felt pretty good about my productivity. But uh, then the delights and attractions of Southern South America began to play out. And I found myself making wonderful trips all around South America with, with uh, my partner, Monica, and um, we had a tremendous time, but I didn't get a lot of the rest of the book written. The sabbatical ended as they always do too soon. And uh, the book had not made, you know, enormous progress. Around that time, though, I also joined with some folks and we wrote a proposal that was funded to form a research coordinate, coordination network about phosphorus sustainability, focusing on all the dimensions of phosphorus, in, uh, agriculture, waste uh, treatment, uh, production of fertilizers, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this was a tremendous opportun uh, opportunity for me to learn from a broad of really, really bright people um about all these different dimensions and a lot of the information and knowledge that i was able to bring to the book came from the amazing folks who are part of this rcn effort over the years one of those was phil hager he came on the rcn scene in about 2015 um, and we began to interact um, a fair amount he invited me over to lancaster to give a talk and hang out for a while and in 2017 i popped the question about whether he would like to uh, join the book project with me because I realized that I wasn't really going to finish the book unless I had some help and I needed help, especially in areas I wasn't an expert in like soil science, for example, and Phil's an absolute expert in that. So I'm going to turn it over to Phil now and he'll pick up the story. Phil. Jim, it's so nice to see you, Jim. It's a shame we can't be together for this moment. We've been talking about it a long time, but the bonus is that we've managed to get many more people from around all our friends from around the world to come. So it's great to see that everyone's able to join us and thanks for showing up today. We, we really appreciate that. So yeah, so I, I'm just gonna take you into where I came into the story. I came into the story around about 2015 and um, it all started with a late night margarita because Jim's really good at mixing up a cocktail. And I remember we were in this 
beautiful resort in, uh, in, in, in Arizona, in the desert. And he, he, he suggested, he said, oh, I'm working on this phosphorus book and, and I just can't get, I just can't get going. I've got stalled. I'm going to need some help. And I went away and I thought about this a little bit. And then time passed and we got together for a lunchtime walk when we were next together in May 2017 in, a, uh, in Washington, D.C. And we went for a little lunchtime walk. We're a little bit more sober this time. And he gave me a bit more of a serious reflection. And he said, you know, I think I need a bit of help with this book. Maybe I should have a bit of help with this book. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe he's going to ask me. And then soon after the email came. And so, hey, I was I was aboard and it was it was a thrill to, to join and, and to be asked to, with such a great colleague to join in. And we really have, you know, we have such a sort of natural rapport and, and we get along so well. It's, it's, it's such a fun, fun experience. So it all started. Um, for me, I joined um, in 2018, um, in May, I went over to visit uh, Jim and his colleagues and his partner, Monica, in, in Montana at Flathead Lake, where he's director of the research station. And I spent some time there. The, the idea was to learn about the book, to learn about the project. And we sat down and I got this lovely little... Um, this lovely little uh, cabin by the lake. You can see the view there in the corner. And I was sat down. And I started writing. And every now and then I'd get tired and I'd go up to Jim's office and we'd go on the storyboard and we'd be mapping out and planning the ideas. And if you can look at the one of the slides here, you can see one of those sessions in Jim's office where we were conceptualizing some of the things that we wanted to talk about. You know, because the great thing about doing a book is is that you know we normally write science papers but if you write a book it's a different way of thinking and you can kind of free your mind a little bit and think more creatively about some of the things which perhaps peer review doesn't allow you to do and you can be more creative and we had some real fun doing that so we started the writing if you go to the next slide now please jim and so then this took us through to 2019 now 2019 was a really key year because 2019 was the 350 year birthday since phosphorus was first discovered by the alchemist Henning Brand. So that was kind of a big kind of uh, peer pressure thing because we really wanted to get the book out for the 350 birthday year. We thought we've got to finish the book in 2019. So 2019 was definitely the, the kind of really busy year. Uh, can you go back, Jim? Uh, that's the one, so yes, yeah, stay with that one. 2019 was the busy year. We had lots of Zoom meetings. We used a Google Doc, which was a really great way to work a, uh, write a collaborative book. I'd, I'd get up in the morning, Jim would get up in the afternoon. We'd be both editing it live. We'd be changing each other's text and having little friendly bickers about what to write and all the rest of it. But it worked really well. And then we actually managed to get a couple of trips in. I went over to uh, Arizona earlier in the year, did a little bit of mountain biking. We always tried to fit a bit of that in if we could. Uh, later in October, we had another birthday party uh, celebration over in Lancaster. And you can see he was cutting the cake there with our colleague, Helen. And we were successful. We submitted the book to Oxford University Press on the 4th of December 2019, just inside the, uh, the deadline for the, for the birthday year. So back to you, Jim. Great. So uh, the submittal of the book is, of course, not the end point of the work. Um, there's still a lot of work left after the draft goes in. Um, and so we had to, for example, design a cover and approve it. We had to build the index of the book. And then our, we had a lot of ideas about figures and drawings and illustrations, but they were rather crude and needed to be redone. And we brought in a professional illustrator to do that. And that all allowed the final draft to be submitted in the final publication. You know, the first version of the book appeared in available in the United States in December of 2020. And I believe it will soon be available in England like next week or something like that very soon. And so now we have now we're toasting um, to a successful book um, production. So let's tell you about what's in it. So here what's what's in it. So uh, some folks have read it. So here's some nice already. So these are some nice quotes from some experts and colleagues around the world. Donna Cordell, such an influential person in all of this. Vaxlav Smil, a world renowned by a geochemist and scientific advisor to Bill Gates, I think, um, has commented on the book. And Nancy Rabelais, a tremendous researcher on the Gulf of Mexico dead zone, has all been kind enough to provide uh, comments about the book that are provided on uh, the website and elsewhere that you can check. All right, so let's talk about it. So the book has 10 chapters um, that are seen here and an epilogue. And then um, each chapter doesn't have 
a lot of citations in it. Each chapter does have two to five different uh, sources of reading associated with it. But at the end of the book, we provide a longer list of things you can look at to uh, find out more about the topic. Um, P is for preface. So we start out, of course, just thanking everyone. So many, many, many people to thank. Many people from the Phosphorus RCN, many people from Lancaster University, Arizona State University, and of course our families, right? And then, of course, we have to thank 15 protons who cooperate um, to form a phosphorus atom. Anyway, yeah, so um, each chapter has, and I'll show it in orange here, most chapters have a preface, have a little um, quote from someone that's relevant to the topic as well. All right, chapter one, chapter one, what do, we, what do we do in chapter one? We describe the globe, the main outline of the phosphorus cycle globally, how phosphorus moves around. And then we also walk the reader through how they encounter phosphorus every day in their lives, from their toothpaste to their food, to their trip to the laboratory uh, and other places as well. And then introduce them to this shocking fact that I can stop a cocktail party conversation dead in its tracks by saying to someone, did you know that you have a pound and a pound and a half of phosphorus in your body right now? So people sort of don't know what to say after that, but I always find it surprising that they don't know that and that they really should. Um, in any case, um, all right, then chapter two, chapter two, we talk about uh, where phosphorus comes from, uh, what it is as an atom, right? We talk about uh, the, the actual atomic structure of, of phosphorus. We talk about uh, how it's formed in stellar nuclear synthesis at unbelievable temperatures and pressures when uh, stars are exploding and, and the like. And we also, of course, give the recipe for purifying elemental phosphorus from urine that was uh, uh, Henning Brand's approach uh, 350 uh, years ago. So that's chapter two. It's all about that sort of the physics and the chemistry of uh, phosphorus as a, as a chemical element. Chapter three is about how important phosphorus is in almost every aspect of biology. Um, phosphorus is everywhere in biology. It's in DNA and RNA. You can see it here, it's these little gray uh, blobs here, they sort of connect the letters of DNA and RNA to each other, really essential role. So involved in the most important molecule in energetic metabolism, the molecule called ATP. It's involved in your cell membranes, in all cell membranes, and in animals with bones like you and all of us, it's, uh, it's in the mineral appetite, which is a calcium mineral. And so it's the reason you can sit up straight in your chair and walk around. Um, so super, super important, all aspects of, of biology. So given how important it is in your body, how do you get it? So chapter four, we talk about phosphorus in food and phosphorus intake and how phosphorus is assimilated, how we get the 1.2 grams of phosphorus we need to take in uh, to sustain ourselves. Normally, what we talk about what happens when animals don't get enough phosphorus, here you can see a phosphor, chicken grown on a phosphorus deficient diet. Um, we also talk about how you get phosphorus out of your body. We talk about kidney uh, excretion of phosphorus, how we maintain the homeostasis, this constancy of phosphorus in our body, very important to our health. And then finally, we talk about the possibility that it might be the case that we can get too much phosphorus in our diets and what that might imply um, for, um, for our, our health with respect to different things like aging and hardening of the arteries and perhaps even cancer. So that's chapter four, phosphorus be, uh, feeding. So next we're gonna to wanna to talk about phosphorus growing, Phil, and I'm gonna get phosphorus into the food. Yeah, so phosphorus growing, here we celebrate really the amazing role that phosphorus has done for life on earth in feeding us it's absolutely this is the thing that it, it really has done it's changed uh, the feeding profile of the earth i just want to read a quote for you from dana Codell on the on the right hand part of the slide and she says in a world which will be home to nine million people by the middle of this century producing enough food and other vital resources is likely to be substantial challenge for humanity and the key point is that we explore here is that is that phosphorus is really driving that. It's really playing a critical role in that. If you look at the main big slide here, the graphic um, below the quote, you can see that what we do is we chart back. We use one of Dana's slides, which celebrates the, the long term use of phosphate rock and its production. And, it, and it's really it's really looking back at its use in agriculture over the years as a fertilizer for driving crop production. You can see 
that midway through the last century, it all took off. It all exploded, if you like, and really helped with feeding the world and, 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 and um, you know, all that food production. And so what we do in this chapter is we go right into this important subject. We explore the history of agriculture, the history of phosphorus use. And then we explore, um, you know, this this kind of acceleration with the use of phosphate rock. However, one of the this is a kind of important turning point in the story, though, because it really, you know, what we try and do is we try and remind the reader that the Earth, right, it's four and a half billion years old. That's pretty old. OK. But we've only been mining rock phosphate, that's the kind of brownie red bit on that slide, for about 100 years or so, right? So that's a tiny pinprick in time, but that's a massive change potentially for the Earth system, which brings me nicely to the next slide. Yeah, so consequently, so we've done all this really great stuff and we've kind of started feeding ourselves with, with phosphorus in agriculture, but inevitably, perhaps, is we also chart the history of phosphorus as a pollutant in water, phosphorus in uh, a pollutant in sewage and then in detergent, which was both of which were cleaned up really in the latter half of the century. And this remaining problem of phosphorus in what's called non-point source or agricultural diffuse problem, which is kind of leaking out of the agricultural soils and making its way out to rivers to lakes and to oceans where it contributes to um, to you know to undermine water quality to algal growth and to general uh, problems of, of, of biodiversity and it's just something we don't want it's really potentially quite dangerous for for the waterways and also for the oceans in the longer term and so um, um, just like phosphorus uh, makes makes the plants grow on the land it also makes plants grow in water that we don't want and this slide, I've got to, got to just mention this photograph. What an amazing photograph. Jim calls it Lake 226. It's, he calls this photograph the most powerful image in the history of limnology. It's, I think it's in Ontario somewhere, in a province in, in Canada. And this is an experiment, I believe it was in the early, early 1970s. And they put an impermeable membrane across the lake. And in one part uh, of the lake at the top, they added carbon and nitrogen and the bottom part they added carbon and nitrogen but they also added phosphorus and you can see how compelling that is what it does in the pollution story and we explore this and we explore the potential for climate change to make this worse which takes me on to the next slide please Jim. So in chapter seven we kind of reflect on what we call phosphorus awakening this is a kind of um, global or, or, or it's all re really about people. It's about our awakening to the fragility of our reliance on phosphorus reserves, on phosphorus, uh, phosphorus, um, uh, phosphorus reserves and, and rock phosphate, because phosphorus really is not a limitless resource. And this was this came into an acute sense of focus around about the early 2000s after the price crash. And um, it really, it really is important to draw attention to it. it only comes from from a few a few places in the world. About over eighty percent in the estimates shown in this slide is from Morocco. Just a few localities in the world, and there is certainly a debate which we address about limitations to supply. I mean, it's quite controversial. People discuss it, but it's certainly a debate which has to be had. And so we talk about this thing about people grappling with what they call a a wicked problem. It's this nexus, this overlapping problem of phosphorus being really good for food. It's really bad for water. But then we've also got this resource issue in that it might be running out and it only comes from a few places in the world. And so there's a kind of fragility there as kind of an awakening came around in the, in the, uh, in the world. And so the chapter charts this upwelling of awareness celebrating some great new thinkers, some people that led us forward there, Dana Cordell, David Vicari, amongst other great names that have taken this forward. And there's a real emergence of, of, of groups, of alliances, of new people thinking and pushing forward the initiatives. And really, probably this book came as a result of that start, which came at that time. So to the next slide and back to you, Jim. Yeah, thanks, Phil. So this uh, in chapter eight, we start to talk about the solutions. We've raised the problems, and now we don't want to walk away, you know, leaving you hanging. So we want to talk about 
Yeah, we we'll talk about how it is we're going to go forward to, to have a better future for phosphorus in um, in the food food and water system. And so this is another nice figure adapted from Donna Cordell. She projecting phosphorus into the future and how we might begin to reduce our reliance on uh, mined phosphate rock and begin to use less phosphorus to produce food by doing things more efficiently and by recycling phosphorus as well. This chapter does, does deals mostly with things that we can do to reduce the, uh, the uh, increase the efficiency of phosphorus use in the food system, thinking about food production as a system. Um, one of the things we can do is the top part of the slide, we can change our diets, replace meat in our diets with non-meat uh, for sources of protein. We'll talk about exciting developments in the area of synthetic meat, impossible foods uh, coming on the scene, stem cell meat starting to emerge. So a lot of exciting developments there. So changing diets is an important thing that we need to do. Food waste all around the world, about 30% of the world, uh, food is wasted before it gets uh, to the consumer's uh, mouth. Um, and uh, it happens different parts of the supply chain um, in different parts of the world, but less food waste will definitely help. We talk about things we can do on the farm and in agricultural practices to improve the ways that crops uh, take up plant, uh, phosphorus to do a better job of that, ways we can apply fertilizer in a better way that um, allows less of it to leave the system. So we talk about that. And the other thing we talk about is sort of system, system level things we need to do and emphasize that fertilizer really should be used to grow food. We use a lot of fertilizer for a lot of other things like bioenergy production and corn ethanol and the likes of that. And uh, that might not be considered the best way to uh, use precious fertilizer. We might be looking at be start, we should be looking at other aspects of uh, and approaches to do those, to those kind of things. So that's chapter eight. Chapter nine is about recycling. So how do we uh, start to replace phosphate rock in the medium to longer term so that we can have an indefinite supply of phosphorus to produce our food? And so there's all kinds of innovation that's emerging right now that's capable of um, recycling phosphorus and other resources from food waste, from animal waste, and, well, my food waste up there, choice, and human waste. Um, and so, um, yeah, so we need to be doing that. So there's bioenergy in that waste, there's nitrogen in that waste, there's phosphorus in that waste, and we ought to be extracting it before we um, uh, get rid of it. We're, we shouldn't be wasting that stuff, right? It's a resource, not, not a waste. And so that's what chapter nine is about, how we can close the loop and create a circular economy around phosphorus is what we really need. Bill, tell us about chapter 10. Yeah, so chapter 10, we thought, well, this is where we kind of end the book or just or nearly end the book. And we decided it wasn't really enough to have a technical manual because probably some of the earlier chapters are a little bit technical. But we thought, you know, that we need to do some bigger thinking about about what what can we do to change, to make a change and to change the world. And we we actually think about how are we really going to achieve a sustainable phosphorus cycle, uh, you know, on our planet and how how is society going to actually pull together and do that? So we did some forward facing thinking about the types of people, about the types of governances, about the types of operators which were required to make those changes. We actually get into kind of people and politics and governance and leadership really and, and discuss some of those things which are really going to be important in making the change, just not just for phosphorus, of course, but for all environmental issues in a way. And we pull particularly on this example uh, in a book published by Charles Mann, where Mann talks about two conceptually different uh, people. Uh, Mann talks about a wizard. A wizard is an innovator who is very reductionist, who specializes in, de uh, in, in, in developing technology. And Mann also talks conversely about prophets, about uh, naysayers, about doomsayers who maybe look at the whole earth system and they're really at strong loggerheads with the wizards. The prophets and the wizards are kind of at, oppose one another, but they both have equally important things to say. This is the key thing. So Jim and I felt that actually that, that the key thing is what we need is a kind of new kind of person, a new leadership where we use the innovation, we use the wizardry, but we also have the big picture and the big system like view of the prophets to pull out a new kind of person where we talk we fantasize about a phosphorus systems innovator 
uh, and we talk about a new type of people and we try to inspire uh, and talk about the types of inspiring leaders that might be able to take some of these things forward because we're not going to solve it just with phosphorus it might be phosphorus with water with carbon with nutrients and with many other things all need to be wrapped up together and we also finish the chapter with uh, things we talk about 10 things we all can do to uh, help sustain phosphorus so moving to the uh, really the last slide now jim and so we we actually we, because we couldn't stop and because we liked a narrative and we were getting along so well we thought we're just going to have to write and we're going to write an epilogue and we thought we'd write it we'd write it as a narrative and we call it driving to san diego all right now this was a, a narrative which we wrote um, reflecting on our time together when we were finishing the book in january 2019 and it comprised it's comprised of three components really um, it starts off with a, a transcript of a creative three-way conversation between myself jim and matt who's hosting the webinar today brainstorming just trying to think fresh thoughts new thoughts you know opening our mind to different ways of thinking about what we can do with the phosphorus problem fueled by some very nice american ipa ale and that really helped we had quite nice ideas some free thinking and then we got in the car and we well we we, we the, the ale had left the system i must say it was another day a fresh day fresh start and we set off and we went on a road trip and we drove we were very lucky it was in the days before before covid and we drove from arizona through the desert through Southern California, all the way to San Diego, where we were we were talking at the Phosphorus 350 uh, meeting. And uh, we made the journey into a narrative and used the journey to look at the landscape and reflect on the phosphorus cycle and just had a conversation with ourselves, because only phosphorus geeks do that kind of thing, about uh, what we thought we could do to change the world and, and what, you know, reflecting really on where we'd come. And so we end the book. I'm going to read. I'm just I'm going to finish by reading how we end the book. And we hand over the baton to the reader and we say, OK, phosphorus system innovators, it's your turn now. Become an alchemist and transform scarcity into abundance, wastes into resources and dead zones into vibrant habitats for the benefit of future generations. Phosphorus holds the key. All right, great. Thank you so much for that, Phil and Jim. That was a great uh, description of the book. And I have to say, you know, I have a friend who has read parts of the book who has no technical background whatsoever, and um, she understood it quite well. So I think um, that speaks volumes because, because these are very complicated issues if you really dive into them and you can get a PhD on any one of these chapters, really. Um, so congratulations on, on that accomplishment. Um, yeah, we should, we have some questions here, um, and I actually, Jim, 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 I'd like to start with a bit of a personal question. Okay. Um, you mentioned my name a few times in the book's epilogue, and we can reflect upon the central role I play in your life later. <laughs> but one thing I noticed is is you actually misspelled my last name several times, and I was wondering <laughs> if you could speak a little bit about the struggle of writing when spelling is such a challenge. Are you kidding me? <laughs> No. <laughs> I did not realize that. <laughs> At least I hope I, I thought this was a great opportunity to put you on the spot. So uh, <laughs> very embarrassing because it's usually <laughs> my name getting misspelled. <laughs> uh, no, At least so we don't sorry. spell phosphorus wrong, I hope. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. You that. got it right. You got that right. Well done. <laughs> oh my gosh, there's a T in it. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The T is unseen <laughs> like the P in swimming. And uh yeah, speaking of P, what's what's the main message you'd like readers to take away from the your P book? Uh, what's the main message? The main message is that phosphorus is uh, uh, an important a key part of their of their lives and the quality of their lives and uh, taking proper care of it is important is critical for assuring a, a viable future for um, for their for future generations. Great. Um, Ellie, it looks like you might be having some technical difficulties here. So I'm going to, uh, we were going to switch back and forth and ask some questions here. Um, but uh, I think Ellie's having some tech problems. She may jump back out here in a minute. Um, we have a couple questions from the audience. And so maybe Phil, you could take the, the first one here. Um, what work has been done on phosphorus recovery from urine and or generation of struvite from wastewater treatment plants? 
Yeah, there's there's been quite a lot of work done on, on those kind of things. I mean, that, that that they certainly show some promise. What we need to do is to try and um, make it more mainstream and more widely adopted, really, to try and take to try and take these innovations forward. Um, Struvite is is a is a is a, a product that comes out of the waste system and, and um, it shows great promise for recycling phosphorus, but we can do so much more. And you, um, Matt, can I just answer? Come back to your earlier question sure. as well about my spelling really, of my name. No, it's no. just about <laughs> what's what we want people to take. The reason this book had to be written, it's kind of like phosphorus is like this Cinderella element. Everyone talks about carbon and nitrogen. Oh, it's nauseating. <laughs> we've just we've just got to get phosphorus. There it is behind me. We've just got to get it out there. And the message is it's central to our life. And if we mess it up, we're going to mess up the world's, you know, the Earth system in only a few thousand years. It's really, and it, you know, we've just got to get our message out there. Yeah, it, it's kind of the uh, ugly stepchild of, of, the, of the other elements, and uh, you're right. That's why we have a sustainable phosphorus alliance. <laughs> um, and so, uh, Jim, maybe I'll ask you the next question, and I promise this one will be, be easier. <laughs> so, um, uh, or, or at least kinder. <laughs> so where and when uh, in society did we go wrong, and uh, why have we gotten ourselves into this this phosphorus mess? What what lessons can we give to those uh, countries who still Ooh. need to use more phosphorus? Who, um, Where did we go wrong? Yeah. yeah. So um, I think that we have it's a, it's partially this wizard profit problem, right? So we have a lot of great wizards focusing on the crops the farm production, right? And they did a great job in, in massively increasing food production, both per, in total and in per unit per square area and even per unit phosphorus, right? And But we never thought real hard about how to deal with all that phosphorus once it's unleashed on the earth system. Um, and so there's where we have a problem, right? So we figured out phosphorus from point sources from sewage and phosphate detergents, at least in many parts of the world in the seventies and got that pretty much right. We still have some issues with, uh, with uh, human waste um, phosphorus sources, but mostly we know how to deal with that. The agricultural phosphorus uh, losses, whew, we just didn't think about it. I don't think that that's just part and parcel of the way we went after. Um, food production and because you know for a long time it's still fertilizers relatively um, accessible for many farmers not everywhere in the world but it's still pretty cheap out there it's not at the top of mind of 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 our agricultural system uh, the ways we the way it works the way we incentivize and disincentivize things and so diffuse pollution very hard in the United States of course the problem is you know that only something that comes out of a pipe is subject to the Clean Water Act and so um, we're relying on voluntary measures um, and a lot of and, and sorts of feedbacks to operate and they're not doing the job at the level they need to right now. Uh, Phil, anything to add to that? No, I'll, I'll, I think we should move on. We've okay. got plenty of questions coming so in. So we've got, yeah, sure, we have plenty here. And another one here on uh, the need to recycle P. And I think uh, this person makes a good point. They said, you know, the major problem with the approach of recycling is that uh, this and this is true of phosphorus. The the waste has little value, um, and so uh, it becomes difficult to incentivize recycling. And and um, uh, we have to rethink that, right? Because it, right. it has little value except in so far as the avoided costs of the damage it does downstream when you don't recycle it. So all of that the leaching of manures and other sorts of phosphorus that's out there in the system. Yeah. Uh, causes real damage downstream when it gets to the lake river coastal ocean and has real monetary impacts on other people who sort of don't really know <laughs> why it is that they're experiencing those losses right and so um if we were able to figure that out capture that in such a way right then the recycled fertilizer actually has huge value that's not captured at its price right um, yeah, the other thing is, is, is that, um, you know, in the agricultural community, I mean, it, it's not so long that I was working in Agricultural Institute and, you know, um, farm waste was called farm waste. And actually what we need to do much more efficiently is celebrate the nutrient value of that manure um, and that 
um, it's, it's, it's incredible how long it takes to change the culture. And there's such a there is a very strong reliance on the application of the new phosphorus. But actually, we need to just really up, still need to up the, the agenda on the recycling and the value of all the nutrients in the animal, uh, animal dung and the manure that is a, is a great opportunity for recycling. Yeah, sure. Um, Jim, this is a good one for you, I think. And you, Phil, obviously, you can chime in too. Um, but what's your view of the peak phosphorus narrative? Is it helpful or is it too deterministic? Yeah, so um, just for the for the sake of the listener, really, this 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 idea of peak phosphorus it's, it's quite it, it became really quite a controversial thing. This uh, in the beginning of this this century, there was some discussion around about the idea that we were going to peak in phosphorus supplies for the earth, and that at some point, uh, initially, it was thought just in, in only a few decades that the phosphorus would peak and then we would run out. And then, then, then what happened is it became rather polarizing and then people started to fall out. We talk about this in the book and you know, individuals started to fall out or misunderstand each other about the calculations. And then they were arguing whether it was 40 years or 400 years about how much phosphorus, rock phosphorus we have left. I think the debate has been really helpful. Okay, um, I'm not gonna come down on the, I think it's complex. Um, uh, the answer, if you want to read the book, buy the book and read the book. If you want to work out how much there is left, I think there is still more to find. Um, I think the peak phosphorus debate is a very important debate for bringing this issue up and focusing minds on us being more sustainable with it. You know, we're never going to run out of phosphorus. It's always out there. Right? We don't do, it's not like fossil fuel energy right, where you break a carbon carbon bond and that energy has gone forever. Right. It's lost. Essentially, so phosphorus is always going to be out there. So it's always going to be a question of how much are you willing to pay. And right now, even with the price higher than it was before the phosphate price spike, it's phosphorus is still pretty cheap. And that's one reason why you know recycling phosphorus doesn't have the payoff that it could otherwise have, right? Because the phosphorus is still cheap. So it's when, yeah, how much you're willing to pay. So I'm not worried worried necessarily about running out, quote unquote, of phosphorus. What instead the issue is who, you know, who has access at what price um, under what trade uh, conditions. Sure, sure. So another question that's come up is, um, are you aware uh, if there are any efforts or research using mycorrhizal fungi for fungus uh, management in water or other systems? Bill, take that one. Yeah, well, um, so mycorrhizal, we talk about mycorrhizal fungi in, in chapter five. Mycorrhizal fungi are famously important for helping phosphorus. They bridge, they bridge phosphorus from the in the rhizosphere, this little zone around the root, and they help phosphorus get into um, they're kind of fungi and they help phosphorus get into the plant root. So they're brilliant to helping do that. I'm not so aware of their of their use in uh, what's the question say in terms of water or other systems. We don't, by my memory, talk about that, but they definitely play a key role in the soil system. But that's a good one, which uh, the anonymous attendee has written in there in the chat. Thanks for that. Thanks for that one. Okay, great. Uh, so the next question is, what's the game changer that is needed to improve global phosphorus stewardship? Uh, we know we, it says, we know what we need to do and how to do it. But, um, why the barrier or, uh, to change or inaction? Great question. <laughs> it, it's a great question, Shane. I'll just, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to slightly dip, dip it. Uh, well, I'll give you two pointers to my answer, okay? Firstly, what's missing is it's, it's just not on the table. That's the problem. It's so complex that we've got to get it right up there with carbon and nitrogen, and then we'll start tackling it together. It needs to be integrated and wrapped up with these other problems. If we just start dwindling around with phosphorus, that won't be enough to raise the attention. So we've got to mix it in with waste, carbon, nitrogen, water management. They, that'll change it. This book is trying to get it more on the agenda. That's what we're trying to do. And then the other little more, more smaller game changes, chapter 10, we list 10 things that we can do to, uh, to talk about sustainable phosphorus management. Buy the book, read chapter 10, Shane. <laughs> and I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in and say, um, Phil's talked about the climate change phosphorus connections. And one thing the Alliance has been working on lately is the connection between phosphorus and climate change, especially with respect to how phosphorus loading to inputs to 
lakes and rivers and oceans drives emissions of greenhouse gases, especially methane. And John Downing and colleagues have published a really important paper about these, this driver recently. And we, and we had them at a AAAS symposium we ran a few weeks ago. Um, and they estimated the present value uh, uh, costs of uh, phosphorus driving greenhouse gas emissions in terms of future mitigation of order of, correct me if I'm wrong, six to $70 trillion. Yeah, six to 90, I think it was, yeah. yeah. So that's a big number. By trillion, 2050. Yes, by, in between, yeah, with 2050 as the, as the uh, end date of that estimate. So. It's, that's a lot of money, right? So I think the game changer could well be, it does seem that we're getting ready to get serious, at least in the United States, I hope, and elsewhere about um, reaching our Paris Agreement targets on emissions. And we're not gonna do that. We're gonna have a real hard time doing that unless we get phosphorus emissions under control. And that dollar sign figure, I think is a big, could be a big driver of what the of the inter of the uh, interventions that are needed to do a better job with phosphorus by incentivizing recycling, by incentivizing agriculture to do a better job with phosphorus management in, in, on the food system, in the food uh, production side. Yeah, let's hope that's a motivator, Jim. Um, another question, or at first a, a compliment, thanks for the great book. Um, and uh, I'm wondering about biomineralization of appetite, uh, any recycling thoughts about this? So pushing microbes to form rocks or source fertilizer or, or as a source of fertilizer. Um, I'll comment on that. It's not something that um, I've explicitly thought about, but Maria, thanks for the question. However, if you actually think about what you're asking, you're just referring to soil formation. That is, the, but that is the biomineralization of appetite, the weathering of soil, the breakdown of phosphorus from soil, the release of phosphorus into plants is essentially the long term soil weathering process, the weathering from appetite, which is kind of part of the natural evolution of the earth. And that's perhaps one way of thinking about what you're raising there as a recycling opportunity. I can't say I've thought about that. Jim, anything to comment there? I have nothing there. You're the soil guy. Yeah. <laughs> You did the recycling bit. I, I know when to defer, <laughs> I know when to defer expertise. <laughs> okay. okay, great. Uh, so what role do you see for bio, wild biodiversity in recapturing lost pea? Uh, for example, whales, seabirds, fish, mammals, bringing pea back to land and redispersing it across the landscapes. Oh, wow. That's back to the future or forward to the past or something like that. Because of course, the classic, you know, um, source of fertilizer has been Guano Islands, right? So not, you know, all around, you know, wars were spot over the Guano Islands, not for fertilizer, for saltpeter, for production of, of uh, explosives and gunpowder, but anyway, um, and then for fertilizer. Um, so that's sort of in Nauru Island, of course, is, was a primary source of phosphorus fertilizer for a very long time in the Central Pacific. Uh, well, is this a, a way to recycle phosphorus? I suppose so. I know there's ancient, ancient Sumeria. They used to use pigeons this way in the desert. They would collect their droppings and, and, and use those droppings. Uh, they would you know, raise birds just to bring the, for the phosphorus from the countryside in to use in their farms. Is that something at scales? I think you know the problem there is, again, a scaling issue the scale of which we need fertilizer to feed 9 billion people uh, sustainable, you know, to feed 9 billion people is huge. And I have a hard time seeing how it'll work, but it's kind of a fun idea though. But also if you just add, it's a little about, if you think about, it's like, it's in a way, it's what's been happening in earth evolution. And it's just really, you know, that's what, that's what's been happening. And it, it and um, uh, over the long term anyway, whether it would make a change, I'm not sure. Over the long term, what happens, right, is that biogenic phosphorus builds up at the bottom of the ocean, gets transmetamorphosed to phosphate rock, and eventually those things get uplifted. Very yeah, long term. Back off the land and then goes back down to the that's, ocean again. That's the ultimate recycling yeah. process, right? So ultimately, yeah. all phosphorus is recycled, even the stuff we are mining. But we but we just sped it up, like, massively. That's a technicality of the time scales. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so moving on to the next question, um, 
can all these problems be solved with um, new disciplinary specific research or do we have to go down sort of the convergence research pathway? So referencing one of the NSF big ideas. Yeah, um, sure. And maybe this relates to that game changer question that was asked. I think that that's what systems innovators are about. We need not only disciplinary expertise and excellence in particular, solve this particular engineering crop improvement problem. We also need innovators on the profit side P-R-O-P-H-E-T side <laughs> um, to detect in a better way what's going on in the environment and how good, how good or bad a job we're doing with phosphorus management in our system. But those are the profits and wizards paradigm. But also, yeah, we need a different way of a different sort of person and a different sort of research enterprise that is the systems innovator concept, Phil. Yeah, we've just got to start thinking differently. I, I really don't believe that individual disciplines will solve it. I think that if we go too deep into the wizard side of the wizard and the prophet, you know, that's not no more. That's just as bad as going too deep into the prophecy side. We've really got to uh, we've got to find new ways of working together. A bit, it's a bit like tackling global pandemics, really. We've got to find, you know, we've got to find ways of mixing it up, listening to one another, taking new leadership. And it's not all about gawky soil or water scientists working together. We need we need some political leaders out there as well. We're just trying to start the debate. Yeah, uh, this is a nice question. Why why does phosphorus exist in so many forms? Why can't it just be P? Uh, well, um, huh. Exists in forms. Well, there are. So, in other words, um, you know, there's phosphate, there's organophosphates, there's, you know, there's phosphine, there's phosphine, there's, there's um, yeah, there's phosphonates. There's, right. It tends to it tends to be happy in its oxidized state. Phosphate that's the most common form. It, it settles in that form. So, the, with the oxygen there, it's the phosphate form which is stabilized. Um, it, it, it's it's hardly ever uh, found in its elemental form in the environment. So, you know, common, the most common form that we think of is phosphate. That's phosphorus with oxygen. Um, and um, yeah, I could go on about other forms, but it's probably not appropriate here. I've got some real passion about some of those forms. <laughs> well, phosphine got a lot of attention recently when they detected it or thought they detected it in the atmosphere of Venus. Um, it turns out that that might have been an anomaly of some kind. Uh, but in any case, you know, phosphorus, the good thing about phosphorus, when I think about nitrogen, forget about it. It's, too, it's got all these stable forms and crazy redox cycles and stuff. And phosphorus, relatively simple thing, 99.9% .9 of the phosphorus you're all going to meet in your life is in the form of phosphate. Yeah. It's got four oxygens yeah. And just to speak the obvious for, you know, for the listeners, which aren't such, you know, of a, such a scientific bent here, it, it mostly does not have an atmospheric component like carbon and nitrogen do. Mostly phosphorus doesn't. We do have this thing called phosphine gas, but it's kind of a slightly fringe. It's very interesting, but I don't think it really holds the key to the future. It's a very much a specialty topic among phosphorus yeah. people. Which I'm interested in. <laughs> yeah, I believe there's some new nature article on phosphine and climate change that's out there and still waiting to dig into. So um, the, um, uh, you know, there was a hypothesis, I think it was presented in your book, actually, um, about uh, bones having evolved as a way for animals to store phosphorus. Is that, am I getting that right, Jim? That's my, that's my crazy idea. I'll okay. Say I'll take uh, <laughs> Can uh, you? Yeah. That's such an interesting idea. I wonder if you could. Well, yeah, it was this. It was inspired some work we did in um, Mexico, where we worked with stromatolites, which are mentioned in the book, an ancient form of life in a very p-limited environment in Mexico called, called Cuatro Cienegas. And we discovered that um, when we added a little bit of phosphorus to the water, the stromatolites took it up. They had more phosphorus in their biomass, and then when the snails ate them, the snails did better. They grew better. And oh, then we thought, oh, the snails are phosphorus limited. Cool. So then we added more phosphorus and the stromatolites. Get, the next year we did a new experiment, added more phosphorus. The stromatolites got really phosphorus rich and the snails died. <laughs> and, and it was clear that they had gotten too much phosphorus in their diets. And then 
Then we found a bunch of other studies that show that, yeah, you can have too much phosphorus in your diet if you're an animal and it has some kind of toxic effect or whatever. So then we speculated, and this is where we really went possibly off the rails, but we got pretty speculative. <laughs> we, we noticed or noted that the Cambrian explosion, which is sort of the appearance and diversification of major animal life forms, including vertebrate animals that have bones, it was simultaneous, not only with an oxygen increase in the atmosphere, but with a gigantic increase in the de deposition of phosphorite minerals. And that was a sign more and more phosphorus was coming off the continental shelves into the oceans and becoming available. We, and we hypothesized that animals, proto-animals that existed at that time had, were used to being phosphorus limited. They had all, because all of a sudden they had all this phosphorus available in their food and then they were like, ah, too much. And then, so when someone got lucky in, uh, among those individuals and they figure out a way to complex that excess phosphate as appetite as calcium uh, phosphate and prevent the toxicity effect. Pretty wild. I had to wave my hands around while I did that. So you could tell that it's strictly hypothetical. Hey, Matt, can, can I just uh, can I just jump in? My uh, sure. just just got a comment. My um, my friend and colleague from New Zealand, Leo, has just put a comment on Leo Condron. I have to mention him because Jim and I are so grateful. He did a lot of proofreading of the book. So thanks, Leo. He's put a great message in the chat that says, dust, Phil, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Because I omitted to say, um, we're talking about phosphine gas. Yes, Leo, of course, there's the dust component in the atmosphere as well. And perhaps we need to do some more work on that. And Leo's also commented um, about the recycling challenge. I mean, if I may paraphrase it, um, he gives an example in the chat of, I mean, i just paraphrase the issue. We talk about all the manure, the, the value of manure, um, the phosphorus that's in manure, but a lot of the problem is, is that a lot of the livestock manure producing areas of the world are not adjacent or sufficiently close enough to the crop parts of the world. And there's a transportation issue with moving around the, the, um, uh, the, the nutrients in the manure. And so there's kind of all sorts of issues that to be grappled with there. I know I've sort of twisted your question or your point a little bit, Leo, there, but it was a nice prompt to make that, that point. One of, one of the funniest things about doing all this phosphorus work, we have this research coordination effort and all these brilliant scientists around the world we gather to talk about phosphorus sustainability. At the end of the day, we end up talking about cow manure. <laughs> it's really, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about cow manure. It's a big problem. Not just cows, pigs as well, and all the rest of the livestock world. It's just a lot of phosphorus coming out of that. We, we can't pretend it doesn't happen. We can't look away, right? We have to deal with it. <laughs> right. But it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity. That's right. I wonder if uh, each of you could say what, what is the most amazing thing to you about phosphorus? I think it's just amazing to know that uh, this chemical element is can function so broadly as I call it a biological accelerant. It is just like this, you put it in systems and they go faster in general. They just go. <laughs> it's just the thing you need to make life go. <laughs> yeah, it, it can do so much good and it can do so much bad. Mm. And it's that tension that has to be managed. It's like the, the good and the bad. We talk, we joke about phosphor heaven and phosphogeddon. And it's about getting that balance right, uh, which, is the, which is the challenge. We've gone crazy in the last hundred years. We need to kind of be a bit more reflective if we're going to manage the world for another few billion years. Yeah, that's a great point, Phil. Um, I think maybe that's a good... Uh, a good spot to sort of uh, wrap things up. I just have a couple announcements that I want to make. And, but before, before that, before, we, before I do that, I want to yeah, yeah. know where to buy the book. You can buy the book at Oxford University. <laughs> That's a good. Or on Amazon, uh, go on there and there's a Kindle version uh, that's available as well. So um, uh, that's where you can get it. Great. Um, I need to share my screen here. Um, so I wanted to, and, and thanks to both of you for spending the time with us. It's again, it's a great book. I highly recommend people go out and buy it. Um, and you guys are very engaging presenters. So it was great to talk to you and get your insights about this. Thanks, Matt. Um, thanks for coming. 
Yeah, sure. Um, and uh, I wanted to let everyone know before we close out that we have another webinar scheduled on May 20th. Uh, it's called Managing a Legacy of Phosphorus. And uh, again, we've got a great panel of speakers there, as you can see here. Um, you can register via our website, which is phosphorus spelled correctly. O, not OUS at the end, just US at the end, phosphorusalliance.org. <clears throat> and um, uh, you can go to our activities page and find the webinar registration links there. Um, also, if you register for our newsletter, which is only quarterly by email, um, you can find out um, information like this, where to find this video that's going to be coming online in the next week, where to come register for this webinar, etc. cetera. Um, the, the last announcement I want to make is uh, Phosphates 2021 is coming up next month, and they're going to do this virtually. This is the big conference for the phosphates industry. Um, if you're a Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance member, you can get a discount and you can contact me for a discount code. code. Um, so I hope you can uh, make it out to this as well. So with that, I think uh, we'll close things out. And once again, would like to thank our panelists. I'd like to thank Ali too, although she she seems to have technical difficulty, have had technical dif difficulties and um, dropped off there at the end, but she helped us a lot. And thank all of you for coming to the webinar today. Thank you. <laughs>